Hello and welcome back to another episode of Green and White, brought to you by Argyle Life. John Smith's v Fosters was the order of the day, but both offerings were flat from the off. New landlord Ian thrust two lads who were barely of legal drinking age in straight into the starting lineup. But Argyle failed to drink Darren Moore's men under the table as the points were shared after both sides served up one of the worst championship games all season. But here's hoping we're not barred from the league come closing time. I did warn you this was one of my worst uh, intros so far, and I think I've proven that. Uh, joining me in this week's round is, uh, I'll start with you, John. John Allsop. How's things? I think you've had enough, mate. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, good. Good, thank you. Glad, glad to be back in the guest chair uh, after my turn as host in your stead last week. Yeah, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, Dan Ellard, how's things? You're on mute. Cut. Yeah, pretty good, thanks. Yeah, and Sam down. How's things? Very good. I didn't think it was too bad, actually. It wasn't maybe quite up to your normal high standards, that intro, but it was it was okay. It, was, it wasn't too bad at all. I'll take an okay. Um, yeah, I don't mind that. It's better than some, some of the things that people send me on Twitter. Um, so, you know, slow and steady starts. As Dan, why don't you run us through first then, seeing as you're the, easily the most level-headed of the panel. Why don't you run us through that? Who, one? who me? Yeah. <coughs> me. Um... Actually, actually, shockingly, offline, Sam has actually been very level-headed since yesterday. I have to give him, give him credit for that. So I hope he's about to live up to those standards. Yeah. Um, OK, I think there's no denying it. It wasn't a very enjoyable game of football to watch. It was quite a flat game. There wasn't much excitement really throughout. Um, I think that there was a little bit lacking in attacking quality from both teams, which is to be sort of expected from us, given we've lost our main creative outlet um, and, and not much. Yeah, not much attacking quality from them either. I do think that there's a lot that we can be happy about, actually, which may not be the most popular view reading um, social media over the last 24 hours. You might be forgiven for thinking that the sky is falling in on Home Park um, when, when it's, it's really not at all, I don't think. Um, as somebody who was the most cynical of the foster appointment of the panel giving their immediate reaction, I have seen a lot to be positive about. Um, the defensive organisation looked so much better yesterday than it have been in a lot of other games. Um, I think that actually when, when you think about um, people saying, oh, we should have just gambled and gone for it and, and tried to win the game and Huddersfield were there for the taking. And, and yes, I get that to an extent, but that, that does have trade-offs. Um, if we had have gone there with a much more attacking approach and really piled men forward and really tried those high-risk passes at all times, Yes, we might have cut them open but won the game, but yes, also there's a possibility we could have got caught in behind, um, you know, and, and, and not been able to recover shape and, and conceded more, um, which has happened on many, many occasions this season. So I think um, whilst it was very defensive and there's no, no getting away from that, I think we have to question, define, um, ascertain what, what a good performance really is. Is a good performance one that, that's fluent to watch? Um, it, it, and I think that all depends on how you define the word good. In that sense, it was not a good performance, but in the sense that it, it maximised our chances of, of staying up and getting results, I think it was a good performance because we, um, the defensive side, was, was was pretty much on lockdown the whole the whole game. They had one quite good chance very early that went into the side netting. They had a, a half decent chance at the end that had to save pretty well. Um, and apart from that, they had their goal, and, and, and well, their goal was a foul. Um, we'll come to that maybe in ref watch. But um, yeah, I think we we did well uh, defensively. We, we didn't really let them have much at all. Obviously, the concern, which Ian Foster himself alluded to in his post match interview, is that we didn't also have a lot either. We had our goal. We had some set pieces where we looked quite pretty dangerous, quite dangerous. Um, and we had the hardy one that could have made it 2 0, but just then. A defender got a good block in and deflected wide. So I think a draw was a fair result. I think both teams had a couple of chances each that they could have got some from, and both that both teams scored with good chances. Um, like I say, Huddersfield shouldn't have been in the position to have theirs because it should have been a foul, but you know it was a, it was a good finish from Karoma. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think positives to take, negatives to take, which I think very much reflects what Foster said. I've been impressed by a lot of his media comments, um, and I've had a little bit of discussion with Dan offline about how much can you read into media comments because, you know, everyone can get away with whatever they like in the media when we're winning and everyone gets criticised in the media when we're losing. And I think that's true to an extent, but I think where you can get some interesting stuff in media comments is what they say about their strategy, their approach, their their um what's the word i'm looking for the way you know the, 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 the yeah, strategy will do so the, the strategy they're going to use to to fix the problems and to maximize the strengths and i think what he's what's really impressed me is he's, he's he said about being able to be better out of possession um and i think that's right i think we've not been a great out of possession team this season from all the quality we've had going forward i think the pressing could do could use some work certainly the the, the um the defensive positioning could use some work um, and, and yeah, I think that that's something he, he identified uh, and the other one was attacking set pieces. And I think the, the attacking set pieces were much better yesterday. Okay. We didn't score from one, but I think we only had four corners in the game. And I think three out of the four corners had good deliveries into the box and all four of them, we looked much better and more coordinated going forward in the box to, to try and get on the end of them. So yeah, if, if it goes on like this, um, is it going to be pretty? No. Is it going to be the start of football? I think we should look to adopt in the long term. No. But is it going to be possibly what helps keep us up with a few adaptations and a few um, upgrades in, in player quality here and there? I think it might be. Um, so, yeah, willing to give them a chance. I liked a lot of what I saw. And I think the areas that I didn't like, Foster is working on and he's identified them as being areas to improve on. So, good point. Let's not forget, we've ended that day Um a point for, uh, and ended the weekend with QPR losing, ended that weekend further away from the relegation zone than, than we started it. With one less game on the clock, we're in a really good position to stay up and let's keep at it and let's just hopefully work on some of those transitions to create better counter-attacking moments going forward. Can I just shock you? I agree with Sam. Pretty oh. much entirely, actually. Um, so this might make for a very boring podcast. Um, and, and that's all from us tonight. Bit. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's good night from me. Um, no, so I wanted to add a couple of things uh, just to more elaborate on what Sam's saying rather than disagree with him. Because I too have seen the the sort of chicken licking, sky is falling commentary, both on social media and from certain uh, people that we know also. And uh, yeah, and I think it's totally misguided um, because essentially there are, as far as I can sort of make out, a number of explanations for why the game played out the way it did yesterday. And I guess when I say that, I'm sort of, you know, presupposing that it wasn't a great performance from us. It certainly wasn't a great game to watch. Um, although, as Sam said, I think it sort of has to, you maybe have to kind of recalibrate what we consider to be a good performance, right? Like ultimately, we've got as many points from that game as we did from the 3-3 against Watford, which people were saying was our best performance of the season. Um, and we've done it while well conceding two fewer goals, obviously against a poorer team, but away from home where we've struggled. So, um, I'm not necessarily conceding the point that it was a really poor performance, but if you, even if you kind of accept that premise, and again, I'll certainly agree it wasn't you know a fluid game to watch and we weren't good going forward. Um, th there are a bunch of mitigating factors. You know, we, we still have basically um, three, well, as of today, three loan slots um, left to fill, and I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that later with the departures of of Kessler Hayden and Warrington. So obviously, the squad is not the finished article. We're in a transitional moment. Add to that, obviously, the much bigger transitional thing, which is the fact that it was our first game under, a, you know, functionally under a new manager, um, first league game, first one in which he's actually picked the team after having um, a few days on the grass with with the players. Um, so, so obviously, we, you know, it, it would be unrealistic to expect a totally fluent, joined up um, performance. Uh, I think in in the first manager's new game in charge. So, so with that in mind, um, I think getting a point is a very creditable result, even if you otherwise don't think it is. But then I'll come on to the other point here, which is I, I don't necessarily think that game would have gone any differently under Schumacher or under Nanskeville and, and Jusnip. Um, and the reason for that is, um, firstly, that we have put in some pretty poor <laughs> away performances this season. You know, it could just have been that we we played yesterday and didn't really turn up. In fact, probably the game that yesterday most reminded me of was the Coventry game uh, where we lost 1-0. Coventry were um, it's now, sorry, are in absolutely flying form, but at the time were... 
uh, I think below us in the league or, or about level on points potentially um, had had quite a poor start and were still pulling themselves out of that. The game was very flat. Neither side really rose to the occasion. There wasn't a lot of attacking quality on show. Everything was a bit disjointed. And on that occasion, um, they won the game with a goal that shouldn't have stood. And yesterday, Huddersfield got a point off us with a goal that shouldn't have stood. So, so the idea that, you know, this performance heralds this kind of definite, you know, new, horrible new era where we've thrown away all of our attacking principles and, and philosophy and have become rubbish all, you know, all of a sudden, it doesn't really stand up to any scrutiny because it's a sample size of one. And we did have games like this uh, under the previous management. And... Uh, finally, uh, as, I, as I just alluded to by saying, um, uh, you know, the, the, the other factor here is is the Huddersfield factor. A lot of commentary that I've seen from people is is saying, well, they were so poor, we could have very easily won that game. Now, I agree they were poor. I thought they were one of the poorer sides we faced this season. No question about that. I didn't think they moved the ball particularly well. I didn't think they carried much of a threat. And beyond a couple of players, um, you know, I felt that just man for man, they, they were not a good side. That being said, they are a team that have... Um, not, I don't believe really been in the relegation zone all season since the, since the opening weeks. Um, you know, a, a lot of that is attributable to having a pretty solid start under Neil Warnock who then left. But, uh, if they were really that bad, they'd have dropped into the bottom three with, uh, under, under Darren Moore and they haven't, they've steered, you know, they've stayed a few points ahead of it consistently ever since then. Um, and part of the reason for that is they draw an awful lot of games of football, um, and over the last couple of months, they've drawn with um, Southampton at home. They've drawn with Millwall, I think. They've drawn with Bristol City. I was looking earlier, I think we're the fifth or sixth draw that they've had since the October international break. Now, of course, we've also drawn a lot of games recently, um, playing a very different style of football to them. And I could not uh, honestly tell you that I've sat there and watched all of those draws and, and sort of know exactly how those games played out with the kind of contingencies of refereeing decisions and all the rest of it. But... I think there is a that that pattern of results and what I have seen of them under more and what I've seen of more teams in the past as well indicates to me that they are a stodgy team who are difficult to break down, have some good players more on the defensive side of things and on the attacking side, and sometimes are able to drag better teams down to their level enough where they neutralize them. They sort of engage in a horrible kind of kick the ball up the pitch game and they cancel them out. Um, I think that is true of them probably more than any other team in this division, with the exception of Rotherham, uh, who I think are, are, you know, set up a similar way. Um, but like even even the QPRs and Sheffield Wednesdays of the world, you know, try and play football more than more than Huddersfield do, in my opinion, despite being below them in the table. So for me, I think there's a very, very strong chance that even putting aside, you know, this being just potentially a, not our day at the office and even putting aside the fact our squad is in transition and the new players coming in, even putting aside it's a new manager's first proper game in charge. I just think Huddersfield are a team that are set up, especially at home, to neutralise teams that are good going forward. So, yeah, I think for all those reasons I've just listed, it is at the very least spectacularly premature <clears throat> to have watched that game and come to the conclusion that, we're all rubbish and that Foster doesn't know what he's doing. And, and, you know, the whole attacking style of play has been thrown in the bin. If we play like that, you know, next week against Cardiff or in some of the games after that against teams that are much higher up in the table, um, then, then obviously that would be a different matter. But, you know, if my, if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bike. We, we haven't played those games yet. We're going to have to wait and see. So yeah, that's my elaboration on Sam's point on the whole, though. I agree with him that, you know, not our best performance, certainly but definitely some positives to take. And I'm sure we'll come on to those a bit later in the pod. Um, and, you know, a, a result that certainly could have been better, but also could have been a lot worse and, and one that I'll take. Moving into some full-time thoughts then. Um, Cornish pilot um, draws similarities between Foster's first league game and Schumacher's. Um, he says, um, I say he, I don't know if it's a he. Cornish pilot says, uh, did Argyle lose today? Some of the social media posts are baffling. Hard fought draw against a team playing for their place in the championship. Eight points clear of Sheffield Wednesday. And with the goal difference, that basically makes it nine points. Remember, Shuey's first game versus MK Dons. Give Foster time. Uh, Barry Evans says, I'm not sure what fans were expecting from Ian Foster after only four training sessions. He's a football manager, not a miracle worker. Actually, Barry, he's a head coach. Not a football manager, but I'll let you off. Um, give him some time, keep the faith, and we'll be fine. Um, Crazy Pilgrim says, frustrating as we controlled the first target, second half we couldn't get into the game. Subs made a difference and Edwards changed our game, um, but just nothing in the final third for the second half. Really disappointing, but it's still a point. 
Um, who else here? Uh, Liam Savish as Foster's going to need to quickly work out who is going to become the main ball carrier for Argyle now that Azaz has gone. Really struggle to um, constructively progress the ball today. Uh, JB Randall uh, could potentially have responsibility, but wasn't they weren't present. Um, MMR Argo Cultist sixty nine says you lot use the word turgid far too much. Sorry, it was it was a turgid game of football. Um, and Michael Michael O'Neill, I assume not that one, says uh, give it time. The new lads will settle in. That includes Fozzie. We will be champion. We are Argyle. Um, Dan, I'll come to you. You managed to go 25 minutes last week without talking. We're only on 15 now, bordering into the 16th minute. Um, so I'll, I'll let you loose early on this one. Uh, I feel, we'll... Sorry, I feel, I, feel, I feel compelled to say <clears throat> uh, that we are already in the 16th minute. Yeah, that's how it works. Um, Dan, what, what have we learned, if anything, about how we look, how we will look under Ian Foster compared to uh, his predecessor? Well, not a lot because it is so early, as the others said. Um, Sam made the point that, you know, he might well have forgone a little bit of how he wants to set us up long term for um, just keeping us quite solid and and, and not playing too many risky balls, um, which is certainly what we saw a lot of um, in the early part of the game. Um, it was noticeable that, you know, our, our outside centre-backs in the back three, um, uh, Phillips and uh, Galloway, were free a lot of the time uh, when Hazard had the ball and basically all the time under Schumacher and Juice Nip, um, the ball would go out to them and we'd try and progress and play through the thirds from there. It was noticeable, I thought, that even in spite of those balls being on, Hazard was looking to go long and sometimes he'd go to Scar, who would then go long rather than play it sideways. Um, whether that's a kind of risk aversion approach of like, we want to be... <laughs> We want to take fewer risks away from home, um, potentially. But it is a little bit frustrating because, you know, we are, this squad is very, very suited to trying to play a passing style. We don't have a target man in the squad. Uh, we don't have a lot of particularly tall players, or certainly t- until last week when uh, when uh, JB and Phillips came in. So it, it was a little bit interesting. And, and then, of course, the irony is, you know, we we do play a lot more long balls. We don't kind of play out from the back as much, but yet their goal then comes from uh, Mumba playing a, a pretty risky ball into JB, who had a man tight to him uh, across the centre of the park. Um, they intercept it, ref watch coming up, um, and uh, yeah, it's in the back of the net. So it, it, it's early days on that front. Um, I think there are certainly signs kind of after we scored. I thought the first 10 minutes we were pretty poor, but then, of course, we scored from... Uh, another long ball straight to their defender, not a lot of threat. And they just um, basically just kind of head it back to um, one of our players. And we've won the second ball from there without kind of doing a lot. It's not kind of progressing the ball or anything like that. We've just kind of forced or, or they've made an error. Uh, we did really well from there. Great ball in from Mumba. Great, uh, easy, easy finish for Whitaker, but good movement. Um, but... Yeah, it's um, it was after that that I was I was quite impressed with how we played. We just seemed to be pressing more, um, had a lot more of the ball in their half, you know, possession and territory, which we really didn't have a lot of in the other kind of seventy five minutes of the game. So it was it was a, a yeah a, a bit of a, a bit of a frustrating watch. Um, but as the others have said, you know, the the result is on its own forget the performance, the result is a good one in terms of our uh, kind of hoping to stay up. And Foster's only been in here five minutes. So, you know, we can't, we shouldn't kind of look into this, I think, too much in terms of this is how we're going to play going forward. Um, I don't expect we'll be as as long ball in future games because unless he's going to bring a, a, a massive target man in and, and you know, that's and that's what we're going to do. I, I, I just don't see that's that's how we're going to play. You know, we've still got, despite losing as as and Kundal, we've still got some very good, good ball players in this team um, and we should we should utilise them and, and keep trying to play this passing attractive football that we have played so far this season. Um, so, yeah, early days on that front. But um, I think this week will be very interesting in terms of how um, Foster kind of gets his ideas across to the squad and how we set up in our first home league game under him next week. 
Yeah, moving on to the two individual um, debutants then. Uh, Jack Coleman, 22, underscore, uh, has asked, can it just be an hour of Ashley Phillips' praise? Bloke was unreal today. Um, John, very impressive first start for the brace-clad Ashley Phillips, who was awarded the club's official man of the match. We managed to uh, wrangle, wrangle ourselves a very good pick-up there, haven't we? Uh, yeah, I thought he was um, absolutely outstanding um and he, he was one where i really liked the look of the signing as soon as we made it um unlike some other people in the uh bottom left hand corner of this chat window who shall remain uh, anonymous for witness protection purposes um but it was nonetheless you know quite a bold move to to throw him in from the start um I imagine that's probably something that would have happened anyway, but with Gibson not making the trip because he picks up a knock, um, obviously would have made that an easier decision. Um, and I thought right from the off, he looked like he'd played, you know, <laughs> far more than the sort of seven or eight uh, appearances that he has made um, in the Football League. Uh, I thought he was really assured both on and off the ball played at least one really nice kind of slide rule pass down the channel, which Hardy chased and, and got in behind on. Um, there was one moment in particular where I think we were worried that one of their players might kind of get in behind the back line. He showed incredible pace, basically just to shepherd the ball back through to, to Hazard. Um, Sam deluded earlier to the chance they had where they put it into the side netting. That was actually after an interception from Phillips kind of sliding in at the back post on another day could potentially have um, and perhaps should have been put away by, I think, Matos for them. But it's still a good interception from Phillips because the ball flashed across the box that someone is about to tap in at the back post and he has to get something on it. And ultimately, it's it's quite a strong, um, you know, foot, foot to it. So um, I thought in the first half, yeah, I was I was incredibly impressed with him. Uh, probably had him on the sort of eight, maybe even a nine out of ten going into half time. In the second half, I, th I felt he was less good, honestly. Um you know, whether that was a bit of kind of tiredness creeping in because obviously he's, he's lacking kind of match fitness at this level. Um, you know, maybe it was just kind of incidental. For whatever reason, I, I thought he looked, looked a little bit less assured. Um, there was one moment where he got the ball and, and sort of kicked it out of play after being given what I think was a, a fairly, you know, unwelcome pass from, from Hazard, I think. But possibly, I think, it could have had the quality to sort of turn his way out of that situation. Um, but generally speaking, you know, even in the second half, he tried to to play, you know, play out from the back. I uh, thought his passing was pretty flawless all afternoon. And I, and I think I won somewhere, uh, read somewhere, sorry, that he won 100% of his tackles yesterday. I think maybe one of the graphics that the club put out, um, which, you know, in, in terms of jewels, you can't really ask more than that. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll caveat it by saying that, it, you know, it was Huddersfield while I kind of gave them some praise earlier uh for being difficult to break down I, you know i did think they were really poor coming forward um and also were missing a couple of the players that might have made it a more difficult afternoon for phillips but um yes so it'll be, it'll, it will be interesting to see how he does against the kind of higher quality teams in this league but i think for a for a you know for a debut for a club he only joined a few few days ago let alone for someone who is of his age and has so little first team experience in his career to this point um i thought he looked you know, really at home, probably like one of the better players in the side. I, I ended up giving him man of the match uh, for, the, for the whole 90, despite being slightly less impressed with his second half performance. Um, yeah, really, really positive. Um, and I think, yeah, him and having him and Gibson in the same team at some point, hopefully next week, if Gibson's injury isn't too serious, is, uh, is quite an exciting prospects i think i said on a previous pod that if we could sort of clone gibson and have someone that good with sort of similar attributes either alongside him in a two or, or on either side of him in a three um that actually that that alone might do quite a lot to shore us up defensively um if not going obviously the whole way um and i think in phillips we've, we've seen the evidence on saturday that he he could be that player um again early days but yeah really really impressive debut sorry that was that wasn't an hour but um i think i've got the points across in a couple of minutes I think that's good. I don't think anybody wants to listen to uh, John Allsop talk for an hour. Um, Dan, I'll come. I'll come to you on on, on the our other new man then, uh, Darko JB. Um, but whilst before you um, talk us through his debut, I'm going to give John and Sam some homework. A bit. Uh, Scott Hannaford has asked about the best debuts that you've seen at Plymouth Argyle. So there's some there's something to think about whilst Dan talks us through our new man from Leeds. Obviously. Um, <laughs> 
uh, much like Ashley Phillips, Arco JB thrust straight into the starting lineup. What, what did you make of him, Dan? Yeah, and it, and it showed, I think, to an extent because um, he uh, did show some signs of kind of not being quite bedded into our system yet, which is absolutely fine because he's played a played so little first team football and B. Uh, has only been with the squad since, was it Thursday we announced it, I think? So, you know, it, it, it's absolutely fine. Um, there's definitely a player in there, for sure. He so, showed some real moments of kind of technical uh, quality on the ball, getting out of tight spots, um, picked a couple of good passes. He played uh, a through ball to Whitaker in the first half, which was just over hit. But if he just took a little bit off it, or perhaps if Whitaker anticipated it a, a little bit, just a tiny bit quicker... Um, that would have been a superb through ball. So there's there's some creativity in there. Um, he won a lot of headers, which, to be honest, you'd expect because he's six foot five. Um, directing them was a bit more of an issue. But, you know, that will be a useful weapon, if, especially if we're going to play a lot more long ball. Um, you know, we'll be playing balls up. We'll probably lose most of the headers um, against centre back. So then it will be a, a question of um, challenging for the second ball. Uh, so JB could be very useful in there um, to kind of uh, win the second ball and then we can hopefully bring it down and play from there. Um, but yeah, he's, he, the, the pressing one was a bit funny and, and hopefully I'm not going to answer a future question here, Aaron, about kind of our tactical um, style in the second half. Um, but his um, a lot of the kind of pressing uh, that we did in the second half was kind of down to, especially after we went to our diamond um shape in midfield on about the hour mark when uh, Randall came on. It was Randall on one side and JB on the other. But because Whitaker and Hardy were so central with the kind of Whitaker at the head of the diamond and Hardy on his own up front, they were very central. The wing backs were very deep, which meant that any kind of width um, needed to be made by JB and Randall. Now, when we were out of possession, Huddersfield would take Hardy and Whitaker out the game by shifting the ball wide. And that meant that it was just down to, with the wing backs deep, it was just down to whichever side it was on, JB or Randall, just pressing on their own. Now, one man press, as we know, is just it's just easy to play around. So it was it, it was a bit of a thankless task. You know, they'd um, <clears throat> excuse me, they'd go kind of charging in, um, trying to press the ball and, and and win it back high up as they were probably instructed to do. But then it would be an easy out ball from Huddersfield because they'd just be able to outnumber us and play through us from there. So yeah, that that kind of um, it was a strange tactical switch and I think it did um, kind of um, contribute to our poor second half performance, if I'm honest. Um, I'm sure there are reasons behind it, but it, it didn't really seem to work, um, meaning we were just not really able to press, didn't have any attacking width and any long balls were coming straight back as well. Um, in terms of in terms of JB's role in that, like I say, he was, he was having to do a lot of pressing. Sometimes I think even in deeper areas though, he would just press a bit, kind of be a bit over eager with his pressing and, and and commit to try and win a ball and then let his man in behind. Um, so it's it's finding that balance, isn't it, of, of when to go and when to just sit in the shape. Uh, but that'll come. So, you know, I think given how little football he's played, it's, it's a very encouraging debut. I think I only gave him six out of ten, but that's kind of, you know, when you consider how little football he's played, that's a, um, that's a pretty promising debut from the lad. If we continue to play 3-4-3, three, three, um, whether his role is better, deeper, he played, he had a little kind of 15-minute spell playing higher up. Um, but I think he's, he's probably better off um, in the kind of deeper two slots in that in that uh, shape. But, you know, with Houghton and Randall kind of competing for there, we'll probably bring another one in with Lewis Warrington having gone. Um, will he be able to keep a starting place maybe not but it's certainly a good option to have and whilst we only have him until the end of the season hopefully we can kind of integrate him well um he can get much more match fitness and um and just game time under his belt and then and then we'll see the player that Leeds fans have told us is is a real kind of promising talent go on then Sam, kick us off with the the best debut that you've ever seen um from an Argyle player um, well, I think there's a lot of good contenders. Um, 
David Norris's debut in which he scored at Crew was a very memorable one for a lot of people. Incidentally, if you've not yet done, please do listen to the My Argyle Life <laughs> podcast with David Norris. It is absolutely fantastic. I wasn't actually at Crew that day. I just wanted to plug the podcast. Um, in terms of games <laughs> I attended, um, I think Graham Carey at Wimbledon in the first game of the Derek Adams era was, was a good one that made us really realise, wow, what a player we've got on our hands here. Um, similarly, um, Callum McFadgen at Crew on the first game of the Ryan Lowe era was a was a good one. Scored and had a very good game. Uh, scored twice and had a very good game. Um, really, I think though, as crazy as it sounds, for just sheer how surprisingly brilliant they were, it would have been the twenty five minute cameo by Reese Griffiths off the bench at home to Northampton. Um, we were one nil down at half time. We brought him on at half time. He was brilliant. We scored two goals very quickly, of which he, I think, scored one and, and assisted the, the other, or was heavily involved in the other. Um, and yeah, he, he completely turned the game our way. He won pretty much every aerial challenge. He was great with the ball at his feet. It, you know, obviously, it didn't work out for him long term. It was never going to really because if you put if you try and introduce a thirty two year old who's never played semi-pro to pro football. There's always going to be that fitness differential. But just in terms of that 25-minute spell before he then got injured, wow, what an incredible spell of football that was. He was um, he was, he was fantastic in that game. And so I think he is actually one of the, the better Argyle debuts I can remember alongside those others I've said also have um, honourable shouts um, for them. I'm just trying to think of others. I think, I think that, that, that'll do for now. Go on, John. Any advances on Reese Griffith? Well, I, I was going to say, coming to Sam first for that question, I was never going to stand a chance given the, the depth of his Argyle knowledge. I had um, plucked out Kerry and uh, McFadgen as well. Um, I'll need to go to Sam for his knowledge on these. Was, was Lewis Rooney on debut for that 5-0 win? in which No, was, I... Full no, maybe, it, maybe? It, it, it was his, yeah, f- f- full debut. First start, so it, it, same with... Um, same with Tyler Harvey in that Torquay game on Boxing Day, which were both very good performances by young strikers uh, on full debut, but neither of them were on their outright debut. OK, well, I'll go for Tyler Harvey on full debut then against Torquay as my as my answer, because I was also going to ask about that one. In terms of league debuts, um, obviously Alfie Lewis at Fleetwood would be up there. Um, Macaulay Gillespie at Rotherham as well. Dan Scar at Rotherham. James Wilson at Rotherham. I mean, there's a lot a lot to choose from, uh, uh, you know, among among those ones as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Dan, you got any, uh, a different answer? Well, if we're going to play that game, John, then I'm afraid the only winner is Robert Tillerker away at Bristol City. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, Andre, Andre uh, Blackman at South End. Or actually, yes, that is the winner of that. Um, yeah, blimey. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. So, we, yeah, th- actually, that's a good exercise. And, you know, when people are saying what a terrible time this is to be an Argyle fan, just remember where we've been. Yeah. You know, um, it was uh, actually kind of going off on a slight tangent. But when um, uh, in that Crystal Palace Cup game, when uh, Eze tore us apart and we lost 4 2, um, yeah, obviously it was frustrating, but you know, I, I was I was kind of drawn back to thinking of kind of times of kind of ten years ago when teams like and no offense to these teams, but you know, the fact we couldn't even compete with them, teams like Port Vale and York were like ripping us apart in the same way that at least, you know, now it's like an eighty million pound player that's doing it, you know, so it's it's slightly less bad in that respect. Um oh debuts, I think kind of every every they've all been all been covered pretty well, haven't they? Um did I've got kind of a, a vague thing about um, George Cooper in my head. Sam, did he have a? Was it on his debut that he kind of? No, no his, 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 his debut was. He, no, his away. debut was at Northampton. Yeah, he he, he came off the bench and was quite poor. Yeah, uh, right, as uh, yeah. as the only as the only one from this chat who was, I believe, present that day. <laughs> I don't know if Aaron was there, but Dan and Sam. He no, right. he he John. Yeah, John's right. I wasn't there, but as as with as with all, as with always about there, I did always watch them back on our goal TV or I follow as it was then back back after. So yeah, he wasn't he wasn't great at all. Another one that's just come to mind actually in um, is, is Lee Cox at Aldershot. Um, again in in the John Sheridan era where he just come in and tried to turn us around. Um, he put in a really good performance that day. We won two one in what was a crucial relegation fight. Um, so yeah, Lee, Lee Cox and older shot is, is maybe my most obscure shout yet. That is a viable contender. I was going to say there's one other in my head, and I can't remember the guy's name, but it always seems to come up in these conversations. It was some 
player from back in the 90s, I think, who made a debut with us, he was quite a young lad, and apparently was like, absolutely incredible and on fire and then just disappeared off the face of the earth sam's got his hand up shock he knows who it is I, no 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 sorry I, i'm afraid i don't let you down i don't I, I've, I've just thought of another one that i can't believe i haven't oh. mentioned he was absolutely fantastic that day which was Tariq backinson at carlisle when we won three nil uh, in what was a 24-hour day for me, because the M1 was closed between three junctions on the way back. I'm sure Dan and, and John um, and Aaron to an extent have heard me rave about how brilliant that day was. And Tyreek Backinson, um, four years ago almost to this week, and it was, and um, Tyreek Backinson that day was, was extraordinary, completely controlled the midfield, um, technically, physically, and mentally fantastic. Um, just a totally dominant performance from him in what was one of the most dominant Argyle performances I think ever away from home that I've seen it, you know, it wasn't the most consequential game. It was midway through the season, although it turned out to be a very consequential game because we went up on points per game. But um, in a season where, despite it being a promotion season, it wasn't the most memorable promotion season for a number of reasons, that performance and that game were very memorable. So actually, I think my new winner um, after heavy consideration is Tyreek Backinson at Carlisle away in January of 2020. And can I say one more before um, we like completely <laughs> before the last of our listeners switches off and goes blimey I mean this really is you know blokes will just sit there naming old footballers and have the best time isn't it mm-hmm. um my my vote will go to Southampton away uh first day of 2010-11 Anton Peterlin, Peterlin a player who was uh pretty unremarkable for us in the one year that he was here uh, but was put in an incredible commanding midfield performance against the likes of uh, Adam Lalana, Alex Oxley, Chamberlain, uh, Morgan, Morgan Schneider, yeah, thank you, yeah, uh, and and various others. So uh, yeah, that's that's who gets my vote. Well, Dan, you managed to steal mine right at the death. I had three. Uh, two of them have been stolen. Obviously, Callum at Thatching up at uh, Crew, Anton Peterlin away at Southampton, and one I don't think any of you lot were there. Um, a, a very good day in my Argyle um, tra- away day memories was the uh, the three all draw away at Cheltenham Town in the Johnston Paint Trophy in 2013, and Hamza Ben Sharif, although he's a banter player now, on the day, <laughs> on the day he looked like an absolute world beater, and I was like, where have we signed this guy from? What a legend! Uh, loved him ever since. Got us 3-1 up. Obviously, we drew that game 3 all, And he also scored his penalty. So he scored twice on debut, if you count that. Um, and yeah, very, very good day. Is there a... Is there, I, was, I wasn't at the game. Is there a look in for Finnazaz against Barnsley last season? Obviously, he scored the winner. Mine's I watched it on I follow. Yeah, I watched it on I follow. Um, and even though I wasn't... The, yeah, you know what? That's not a bad shout. I don't think he's quite up there in the tier of the... Very best ones we've mentioned here. But yeah, that, that's a pretty pretty solid shout as well, I would say. Although actually, I think Mumbo, despite not getting the goal, was just as good as his ass that day as well. Yeah, nice. Um, if you're still... Oh, I've, got, I've got another one. Oh, go on. No, no, I haven't really. I'm just kidding. Oh, brilliant. Um, if you have got one and you are still listening, let us know in the, in the comments section on Twitter or Facebook or wherever you found this pod. Uh, and then YouTube. and then promptly go outside <laughs> and do literally anything else. <laughs> yeah, as John was saying. Uh, John, you alluded to uh, Mr. Finn and Zaz. Obviously, uh, Callum Wright has been uh, tasked with replacing a Finn. Um, thoughts on his performances since uh, Finn's departure? Um. And mind you to toss this one over to Sam because he, I think, has stronger opinions on Callum Wright and also, I think, hasn't had a question thrown his way on the actual game uh, since the beginning of the pod. Uh, I'm not, I don't really have any strong Callum Wright opinions, is, but Sam... This is an Sammy incredible day that you're actually opinion. wanting to hear Sam's opinion on things. I know. Right. Don't, on, don't, don't get used to it. Yeah, sure. OK. Um, as somebody who was absolutely, um, you know, fell in love with Callum Wright as a player when he came in last season, I thought he was dazzling on the ball i felt he he really you know had a, that knack of the unexpected um what really like on his debut, run. Man? um <laughs> on his debut he wasn't too great it was at bolton um and it was quite a defensive performance we didn't really get on the ball too much but after that he would he was really good I, I i really liked him and he gave me one of my 
finest, if not the absolute finest ever moment as an Argyle player, which was that full time at Shrewsbury away, as Aaron is, is obviously repeating. As, okay, as, as, an Argyle, as, an, as an Argyle player. Is that what I said? Uh, as an Argyle, as an Argyle, oh dear, Argyle. I meant him as an Argyle player. Gave me the moment as an Argyle fan. My words got a bit jumbled. I apologise. What, what um, were you like on your debut, Sam? Uh, terrible, <laughs> absolutely terrible. <laughs> And anyway, moving on to analysis, I thought he was really good in League One. He had too much for um, for League One defenders to handle a lot of the time. And when Finn Azaz was having his little wobble coming back from injury, not putting in very good performances, I think Callum Wright really took the mantle and really absolutely made that place his own. So he has already shown that in a lower league that uh, coming in for Azaz doesn't face him. Um, in the championship, I don't think he's been as good as I would have hoped so far, It really, to be honest with you. Um, look, I want, to, I want to put some caveats in there, which is that up to very recently, we've largely moved away from 3-4-3, three, three, which is a system that I think suits him perfectly as an inside forward. Um, that's caveat number one, because I think in a 4 3, three he either has to play as a winger because, you know, the three up front in a 4-3-3 three, three is different to the three up front in a 3-4-3 three, three because... There's less width for the free. There's less width in a four-three-three. The wide players have to go a lot wider. Whereas in a three-four-three, there is already width, so the wide players can go more inside. Callum Wright does not suit having to go wider. That's not his game. His game is cutting in, dribbling past defenders, and getting into dangerous areas. His game is not being an out-and-out winger, which he kind of has to be. So I think the four, the four-three-three hasn't helped him one little bit. So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two is that he did have quite a lengthy injury from kind of September to late November, early November. And during the time that she was injured, that was when we briefly went back to 3-4-3 for a while. So again, he, he's got unlucky. I think he's absolutely got unlucky. But that being said, there does come a time where you have to say that for all the excuses, he's also not done enough um, to really make that place his own. And I think that's what I would be saying about him now in all truth. Um, the Sutton game, yes, you know, he has the excuse of it being 4 3 3. He played far deeper than he would have liked. But, you know, on the other hand, it is Sutton. It is a League Two team. And I think he was sloppy, ineffectual on the ball, and was lucky after putting in the performance he did to find himself starting at Huddersfield. As for his performance yesterday, look, he had two moments of absolutely fantastic quality. Um, he put the ball out to Mumba, which who then crossed it into Hardy for the goal. And he had a lovely ball over the top. He set Hardy away one-on-one. That unfortunately, Hardy couldn't quite um, get his touch right and, and, and the opportunity sort of kind of disappeared. But again, two really good moments of quality from Callum right there. Apart from those two moments, I don't think he was great in the game. Um, he had, you know, he, he had some other moments where he did basic things right, but those were the only two moments of real quality that he showed. Um, and I think there were a lot where he was a bit sloppy. There were a lot where he didn't do quite enough off the ball, which I think Foster, having spoke so much about out of possession, will be talking to him about. Um, so, look, I, I'm not ruling him out. I'm not saying, you know, now we're in the championship, he's not up to it, get rid because he is still a young player. I think he's still only, what, 23, I think he is, or possibly not even that. He, he, he's not, he's 23 he is, I think, yeah. Um, he, he's he got a lot of improvement to come. Um, he's not someone who's massively reliant on his pace and, and dynamism, because he's more about trickery and skill. Um, I think if we are going 3-4-3, three, three, which the signings of Phillips and JB very much look signings more suited to a back three than a back four, certainly Phillips. Um, I think with that, Callum Wright will get his chances, but he also needs to start doing better when he does get those chances, because at the moment, it, it, it's it's looking like he's struggling to step up. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's just him not having the quality, because I think he does have a lot of quality on the ball. I think it's game awareness to an extent. It's, it's not being involved enough off the ball to an extent. I think these are things that can be worked on on the training ground. But at the same time, the clock is ticking. Um, and whilst we're in a survival fight, we have, we want to be, you know, we can't really carry development players. So I think he's got to learn. He's got to learn fast. Um, do I think that he's a like-for-like a, a, a -like replacement for Finn Azaz in terms of quality? Absolutely not, I'm afraid. Um, Azaz this season has just been fantastic. As much as I like Callum Wright and I'll always hold a great deal of affection for him, um, for last season, and as much as I think he can get better, and maybe may very well will get better, at the moment he's not doing it, and he does need to improve fast. It's my take on Callum Wright. 
nice and succinct. Um, <laughs> Dan, um, we put out the tweet, obviously, asking for people's um, uh, questions and things they want to talk about. Uh, the biggest one being the foul of JB leading up to their goal. Do you, do you want to take ref watch this week? Yeah, can do. Yeah. Um, as so, I alluded I just, to I earlier. Will, I will add, uh, Joe Bell has mentioned it multiple times in the chat, that the referee is from a town <laughs> five miles away from Huddersfield. So I feel like if we don't mention that, uh, Joe won't be too happy. So um, away you go with the Huddersfield referee bias. Indeed, yes. Well, it, it, it is interesting and I, I don't quite know how that works in terms of whether that's a, a kind of regular thing. You know, I think they kind of declare as a supporter to a team or something like that and, and then it um, makes sure they're not put on their teams or direct rivals of those. But yeah, five miles away seems seems quite quite surprising, doesn't it? Um, but look, I, I don't think that's really kind of got any necessarily any bearing on it because if it does did transpire that he was a secret Huddersfield fan or something like that. Well, it just it just wouldn't happen, would it? Surely. So I can't imagine um, there's many secret Huddersfield fans. Could you imagine, like you know that the, the the show in which a secret millionaire goes into their uh, their businesses and they like re, like disguise themselves, but you have to disguise yourself as a secret Huddersfield fan. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I love yeah. um I love the secret Huddersfield fans column in the Telegraph. I read it every week. <laughs> I, I'm I'm just trying to think of puns with like terriers and yeah, is none come to mind. I'm sure John will think of one in a minute um, with his um, you know journalism expertise. Um, the uh, well, you've completely thrown me now. Oh yeah, ref watch. That's what I'm doing. You could you could say they're going in dog nito. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I wouldn't open with it. Um, what I don't like about that, by the way, is that Aaron and Sam laughed heavily and both muted themselves. So people listening to this... Are probably <laughs> going to well, it's a, it's a good noise. thing we're now on YouTube as well, isn't it? So they'll be able to yeah, see the delighted the reactions. So to see and Sam maybe, and side split. maybe you'll get a criticism for laughing at your own jokes before you get to the end of them as well. But hopefully not. <laughs> um, yeah, so as I alluded to earlier... Um, it was a kind of, it's another bit of pill, bitter pill to swallow in terms of another decision has gone against us and it's potentially cost us points. But this one is kind of, um, is, is less difficult to take because it's just kind of added, the, the frustration for me is the fact that we're playing that ball into a dangerous area anyway. Um, you know, a lot of how we were set up, as I said earlier, was is kind of trying to be less play less high risk passes and be more solid and be more compact and sit a bit deeper and, and not commit as many numbers forward on a, on a counter attack. Um, so to concede a goal as we did by playing a careless pass across from Mumba is frustrating. However, yes, he has been cleaned out kind of from behind as well. Um, it, it's just a pretty clear foul, isn't it? Um Certainly, I think Houghton, after the goal went in, you know, was was in the ref's face and was very unhappy with it. We, it's not as if we surrounded the ref, but Houghton was certainly one that went to him. Um, it's yeah, it's frustrating. The kind of the timing of it as well. You know, we were at the end of our kind of fifteen minutes of, of playing quite well, and then that kind of knocked the stuffing out of us a bit. Um, and then we just kind of got through to half time, and then the second half was pretty poor. So we didn't have a lot after that moment how the game would have gone had it not happened, you know, who knows. But that was a, that was another frustrating one to take and it's kind of a add it to the list of, of um, the decisions that have gone against us this season. Uh, he did make a couple of other odd decisions um, in the game. The, the, the biggest one for me was, was booking Connor Hazard for time-wasting when he didn't have the ball yet. The ball boy was kind of faffing around to give him the ball back. Um, and then before the ball reached Hazard's hand, or as the ball reached Hazard's hand, uh, the ref got his yellow card out. I, I, I feel like there's something that we've missed that is given him more justification for booking him, because surely, surely you wouldn't 
you just like see what's right in front of you. I mean, referees can all do that other than Chris Sargentson. All referees can do that. So it's just like it, it's just completely baffling. So I'm I'm completely confused by that one. But um, hopefully, uh, hopefully someone can shed some light on that. Maybe he had a, another ball closer to him and didn't need to go to the ball boy or, or whatever. But I'm I'm really stumped by that. Also, um, it was also, the... it was also one one. It's not like we were defending a one nil lead or a two one lead. Like you know, I don't, I don't. I, I, I mean, we weren't, we were we were time wasting. Let's have it right, but we, we weren't doing it in that occasion, were we? We absolutely weren't doing it when he yeah. hadn't picked up the ball. It was, yeah. it wasn't the most consequential of decisions, but it was possibly the most baffling. It was absolutely ridiculous why he did that. Yeah, we 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 were we were time wasted quite a bit. To be fair, I mean, um, one of the I can't remember which sub it was it might have been Houghton who who kind of went off very very slowly. Um, and also there was the moment where Houghton was um, was injured but off the pitch, and he went back onto the pitch and then went down. So the referee stopped play. Obviously, that meant he couldn't come back on for thirty seconds again. But it's yeah, that was a little bit um, yeah. Are we Wickham in disguise, perhaps? But. Um, yeah, the, the the one other decision that sticks in my mind that being quite a poor one from the ref was uh, one that went in our favour, actually, and that was not to book Mikel Miller, someone who's made a bit of a reputation for kind of quite late, naughty challenges, and he really left one in on um, on one of their players. Um, I think the play progressed and he um, just played advantage, but he probably should have, after that, finished, uh, booked him because it was, it was quite a naughty one, kind of similar to the one Randall did and was booked for. Um he possibly also, just through sheer accumulation, I don't know how many fouls exactly JB gave away, but I feel like it was probably pushing double figures, to be honest. So, uh, and, you know, we, and none of them really were malicious. It was all just kind of little, you know, just kind of a bit over-enthusiastic and just kind of barging into the back of players and, um, and yeah, nothing too cynical, but just through sheer accumulation, uh, he perhaps could have booked him as well. Um but I, I do think um, he did show, you know, there were, there were some some good moments in there as well. I think um, their number 14, who I can't remember his name at the moment, um, he booked him for a kind of very petulant um, uh, go at the lino. And sometimes you see them let go, but it was good to kind of stamp down and just go, I'm not having any of that. Here's a yellow card. Um, and uh, there was also an incident in the first half where... Um, how often do we say referees just, uh, you know, give everything every time a player hits the deck? Um, there was one where a Huddersfield player was kind of going down in stages and trying to make it look like the Argyle player was uh, was was dragging him down. It was down their right side um, and then just kind of knocked it out of play and then finished his going down. And the referee was like, up you get, not having any of that as well. So he he did make some very bizarre decisions, but... Whilst it is very frustrating that the big one was uh, not gone in our favour, I don't think it was actually terrible at all. Now, I've got four more things to talk about. Two of them on the game. Two of them are um, recalls. I don't know if you've seen the news, which I'm sure you have, um, which we'll get on to. Um, a couple of things that uh, people want to talk about. So, um, Jack Leslie um, is back. He's back with the questions. Um, were you surprised that we sat in and seemed quite content on settling for a point uh, from quite early on in the second half? Not sure if it was by design or just how the game went, but we just stopped attacking. Huddersfield changed to a five in midfield and we didn't do anything tactically to counter it. Um, and Zach Brown says, anybody else worried about the lack of creativity in the second half? It was almost like the game plan switched to park the bus. I think I'll give that one to Sam because he's the next question is about Bundu. And I feel like John should answer that one. OK, um, am I a little bit concerned we stopped attacking? Well, I, I, to be fair, I think I kind of answered that in, in my view of the game to an extent. I, I think that, um, I look, I don't think it was great fun to watch at all. I, I, look, I, that second half, it wasn't entertaining. We we didn't have any of the sort of bursting runs for. We didn't have any of those lovely threaded through uh, passage um, that, that we're used to seeing. We didn't have much hammering on the door. We We had, in the second half, we had a couple of breaks away that didn't come to a lot, two corners, one of which was quite threatening, the other was a poor delivery. So, yeah, we didn't have a lot. Um, I'm not concerned for a number of reasons. One, because I think clearly 
Foster's got a, a long-term plan that's bigger than this game. He's trying to get the defence sorted out first. And then once he's got the defence on lock, maybe he'll then move on to to really fine-tuning the attacking side of things. Um, secondly, I think we're maybe not looking into the fact how much of this is a game-specific plan. I think at home against Cardiff, we will be a lot more attacking. I think this was a must-not-lose must game rather than a must-win game. If we had lost, we'd, we'd have been Huddersfield would have been right breathing down our necks and, and then we'd have been one point closer to the relegation zone as well. I think getting the draw was, was pivotal. Um, and I think the third, thirdly being, I think we will probably be better uh, in terms of looking more likely to score, getting on the attack more once we bring in some attacking players. We've cleared, we've lost the Zavs and Cundall, who I think were probably both in our best team this season, which is maybe harsh on Randall, who had some fine games in recent weeks. But I think Cundall over the season ha- has had the edge of it on him. So we lost two players who were in our best team going forward. Let's wait till we replace them. Let's wait until we're in a game where the risk of losing isn't so high. And then I think we might see some more attacking play. So w- was it fun to watch? No, but I'm also, I also would not sound concerned. It's such a small sample size and there were a lot of other positives to take. And I think there are many reasons that we, that we can see that the attacking side will pick up in the future. Moving on then. Um, Ryan Argot Flyer says, why isn't Bundu coming on? Is he still suffering from injury? Uh, Gavin Jones says, it's not a pod without a question from Gavin Jones. He says, uh, what has Bundu done to deserve zero game time? We're screaming for his quality today from about 60 minutes. He looks after the ball. And he's far more physical than Hardy or Callum Wright. Um, could he have made the difference? Is there any hangover there from his injury? Or uh, I suppose we don't, we don't know, but. Yeah, thank, thanks for saving a question for me as if I would have some intel or, or insight on this when I have about as much idea as everyone else here, which is not, <laughs> which is not a lot. Um, look, I mean, obviously, I think we've all seen the pictures of the horrifying gash down his shin, which he suffered after that dreadful triple red card challenge against Rotherham, which, of course, only got a yellow. Um, you know, it was a nasty injury and... <laughs> I'm extremely not a physio or a medical doctor or any type of doctor for that matter. Um, but it would not be hard for me to imagine that unlike, you know, a muscle tear, for example, that might be one way you could be past fit to play and be involved in squads fairly quickly, especially wearing shin pads, but still have, you know, pain, sensitivity, maybe a bit of kind of a psychological thing around it. You know, I just, so, so, you know, th- those all seem like possibilities to me. So if I was guessing, I would I would say that the most likely explanation Occam's Bundu's razor, if you like, I'm not saying he shaved his legs or anything. That's a, a philosophical reference. Um, would be that he is yeah has has a bit of a hangover from the injury. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't read a lot into him not playing much against Sutton particularly. I think yesterday it was a bit strange that he didn't come on if he was at full fitness and he was going to go just because. While he is deceptively not necessarily a hugely physical player, um, given his size and his height, um, he's probably more of a physical presence than Hardy and certainly than Wayne. And it was a game where you know it did get quite physical and scrappy in the second half. Um, obviously, we also know that he's got a lot of pace to get in behind. So he sort of combines those two attributes quite well. Um and he can play, you know, as a kind of in behind the striker or a winger as well. So so there was kind of quite a lot of pretext i would have thought to bring him on yesterday uh, and it certainly would have been a substitution that i would have made instead of bringing on uh wayne not that not that wayne had a ton of time to do anything himself um but but I, i'm you know I, I don't necessarily think he would have necessarily made the difference yesterday you know i certainly don't think he's a better player than ryan hardy who was on the pitch for the majority of the game and worked really hard I don't think Bundu is a target man, as I just alluded to. So I don't think he necessarily would have done a ton better with the sort of long balls that were somewhat mystifyingly hammered up towards Hardy with with regularity. Um, Yeah, I think it's probably a question where, much like everything else with Foster, we're going to have to wait and see over the next few weeks whether this is a, a case of him not really matching Foster's style for whatever reason, or maybe Foster just doesn't fancy him, or it's or it's more of a, a hangover from the injury. But yeah, as I said, I would I would guess the latter if I was if I was a guessing man. Yeah, the weird thing is with the injury, though, is just the fact that, you know, if he is being named amongst the substitutes, um, I think it was the 86th minute that we made that sub and brought Ryan Hardy off. Like, surely Bundy would have been good for 10 minutes. I mean, it, it, it seems like if he's not even good for that, then 
why why have him on the bench unless it's just kind of filling a slot on the bench? It just doesn't. Like, well, yeah, I mean, point. even then you could. I, I'd agree with that because I, I, look, you could make the argument that maybe he, in absolute emergencies, like say for example, God forbid, we had yet another occasion where two strikers got injured in the same game, he could come on, and and maybe that is it. But then why not just have a sacker on the bench? Unless you want to get minutes to the under 18s, I guess. But you know, he was it, it no, seems I, a bit of a. I thought someone Isaka said yesterday. That, I thought someone said yesterday that Isaka got a knock in the FA Cup game and therefore wasn't in the squad. But right. I, I, that, that is a that's just something I heard. I don't. I, I can't remember who even told I mean, me that. So if yeah. that's so, if that's so, that would explain maybe why we're having a walking wounded bundu rather than an empty slot. I guess. But broadly, I agree with Dan. It does seem nice. Um, John, I've absolutely butchered that because the question I left for you was actually a question that you asked me yesterday that I told you that I'd ask you today about Huddersfield fans booing the, their own team off. So, um, yeah, butchered that. Not really sure we've got time or really care about Huddersfield fans booing their boo, own team off. Boo, no. boo, okay. um, boo, Kane Kessler Hayden. Boos, there you cool. go. You could have put that in your introduction, couldn't you? Boos. Because it would have fitted with the, the theme of of beer. Nice. Ken Gessler Hayden has been recalled from his loan spell by Aston Villa, with Chris Errington reporting that it's to be involved with their first team squad. Um, good luck with that, Kane. Um, Dan, what are your thoughts on the on the recall? <laughs> how, how much did you how much did you cry yourself to? I was going to say to sleep, but it was today, wasn't it? <clears throat> As Sam Sam pointed out, it made a fair point. I think in the game that Villa played today against Everton, the only name was it was it seven subs or eight subs or something. No, eight, eight, eight subs. Right. Okay. So, yeah. but but either way, you know, they might have had whether it, I'm guessing their youth team played also this weekend, so they couldn't just put a kid on the bench. But it may well have been that um, had it happened a bit earlier, that uh, Kesler Hayden would have actually been in their match day squad for the game today. Um, but yeah. It, for a team that is near the sharp end of the Premier League, um, Kesler Hayden hasn't really shown that uh, level, has he, <laughs> uh, to be honest? Look, it, it's a weird one because he's had some very good games with us. And I think um, whilst he, I don't think, really was suited to the inverted fullback role in a back four, um, you know, you've got to be really kind of technically good. Um, have a good eye for a pass, be very good in tight areas and have good first touch and close control. He didn't really have any of those attributes. But when we played a back three and he was able to push forward to wing back and just basically fly down the wing um, and be more um, about providing attacking width and putting crosses in and, and linking up in higher areas, I think he was generally much better. Um, defensively, yeah, had some had some, some shaky moments Um and um, I think the Southampton goal quite early on in the season where he was playing left back that day, but just didn't quite tuck in quickly enough. And then they got shot away and scored. Um, yeah, he was um, a pretty good player for us, I think, on the whole. Um, but whilst it is more, you know, more transfer business for us to do, it does free up a loan slot. And it is possible, I'd say, very possible that we can bring in an upgrade on him. Um, that can cover, um, that can cover right back or right wing back. Um, hopefully, you know, like I say, he did play left back um, for us quite a bit earlier on in the season. But now that you know we've got we've got Galloway fit, we've got Miller fit. Fingers crossed, we can keep those two fit. Um, and Saxon early coming back into the fold as well. Um, hopefully, you know, we we don't need to go out and get someone else that needs that can play left back um, as urgently. Certainly, if we play a back three. Uh, left wing back, uh, we've got Mumba that can do that job as well. So, um, yeah, it does free up a loan slot for us to get an out and out right back and challenge Joe Edwards. Um, I'm a big Joe Edwards fan, and I think that he, when fit, um, should start for us most weeks because um, leadership and organisation are big aspects of a team that can often be overlooked um, over, you know, technical ability and and, and pace. Um, that said, if we can bring in um, another loanee who can challenge Edwards and when we've got three games in a week, you know, play one or two of those, um, then, yeah, let's go and do it. 
Um, yeah, so it's it's a bit of a shame to see him depart. Um, I think he's a he's a pretty good player, but um, yeah, not not devastated. Yeah, I can't remember the the wording of the uh, recall uh, press release exactly, but there were the, I think Jusnet was talking about having somebody already lined up ready to come in, right? So. Um, hopefully that's done sooner rather than later. Obviously, as well. Um, just, a, just a quick one on that. Sorry, very quickly. Um, there are rumours going around um, Oxford United that um, their right back Finn Stevens is, is set to be on loan to be set. Who is on loan to them uh, is set to be recalled. So you know, right back could put two and two together. Maybe that he was the, he's the captain of Wales under twenty ones, incidentally. Ooh. So maybe that could be what that's to do with a Finn replacement. Um, okay. Finn uh, replacement, yes. Yeah. yeah, well, we look forward to that not coming off. Um, John, maybe I should have asked Dan about Warrington, seeing as his only appearance, real appearance, was against uh, obviously Richie Wellens' men. So Dan had a vested interest in that game. Um, Lewis Warrington returns. Um, he tweeted saying, A good club filled with even better people, despite not getting the chance to prove myself on the field. Uh, I've learned valuable lessons that will carry. I uh, will carry with me throughout my career, wishing everyone at the club nothing but success. Um, obviously, he's been he's not likely to be fit again before the end of the transfer window, so he's he's stuck at Goodison. Um, I mean, there's worse places to be stuck, isn't there? Uh, until the in, until the end of the season, obviously, he didn't didn't really get a chance with us, but it was sort of expected that he's going to be recalled, right? Yeah, he's stuck in Toffee. Um... Yeah, he. I, I'm honestly very surprised that this loan wasn't just cancelled on the first of January, or even with you know, you know announced before that. Um, so I can only assume it's taken 14 days of talking over the terms, or or getting a fitness prognosis, or whatever. I just, I mean, uh, Jusnip when he was asked um, in one of his final press conferences in caretaker charge, said he understood that Warrington was coming back here after his injury. To be honest with you, I, I, you know, unless he's been in carrying that injury for the whole season and that has impacted the few performances he has has had for us, I really don't think that should be the determinative factor in cancelling his loan. I think we should have been looking to send him back anyway, and I'd be a bit surprised if that wasn't the case. It just simply hasn't happened for him here. Um, you know, obviously, all of the other loan signings that we've had this season and just generally really in the kind of recent era of supporting Plymouth Argyle have, have been really impactful and very good. Um, you know, Kessler Hayden, I, I agree with Dan. I'm not devastated to see him walk out the door, but was still a very solid player who started quite a lot of games for us. And Warrington just like wasn't getting the minutes that would kind of be the point of having a loan spell if you're a player at his, at his stage of development. Um, you know, the positive he, he played, um, Yes, against uh, Dan's beloved Richie Wellens, late Orient. I think he also played in the Crystal Palace game in the in the cup and was very good, but then was in very short order overrun when they brought on <laughs> Aberi Eze and other Premier League quality players. Um, he did quite well in that game. Thought he looked assured on the ball. Obviously, he's got a good amount of technical ability, but you know, the, the very few times I saw him play um, in a Championship, um, Bristol City away, probably sort of epitomising this. He looked desperately off the pace like he wasn't strong enough um so yeah hard to evaluate um in terms of his actual kind of ceiling because he got nowhere near it down here i think he skipped a loan that he needed to have before coming to this level basically um you know i think his previous previous loan sorry was at fleetwood if i remember correctly and so sort of bottom end of of league one last season in a team that respectfully to them having seen them a couple of times in recent years don't play particularly attractive football i think from there if if they were looking to progress him he needed to go on loan to an upper end league one side maybe you know us last season would, would be the kind of caliber uh, caliber or or profile of club that you'd be looking at um for his next steps maybe a an oxford or a derby or some you know portsmouth sorry i said a, i said an upper end league one club um uh so, you know somewhere like that so um he yes the championship was just a huge step up for him very clearly uh and one that he was unable to make again i don't know exactly what his injury profile was for the entire time he was here for me that seemed like a more recent thing but whatever the reason it didn't work out it didn't work out so yeah obviously fair play to the lad obviously no no questions about his his commitment to the club or anything like that and his statement on the way out the door for whatever that's worth was very professional and 
nice to see. Um, and obviously, yeah, we wish him nothing but the best for the rest of his career. But I am delighted that we have that loan slot freed up. Um, because it because it really does feel like a free loan slot, you know, like it, it doesn't feel like we need a replacement for Lewis Warrington because he never played. It's, it's you know we don't. It's not like he's a, a hole in the squad that we need that we need to fill because even if we were short in that position, it doesn't feel like Warrington would have been trusted necessarily to come in and get a run of games. So um, yeah, maybe that's something we can use on a striker. Maybe it's something we can use on another defender of some description. You know, I, th I think Foster should see both that and the loan sort of free loan spot that we already had after not using it in the summer um, after losing out on Josh Coburn. Um, yeah. He, he should see those as kind of, kind of aces in his pack almost to, to be able to, to reshape the squad more in his image than than kind of doing the necessary work of replacing the other players who've, who are on loan and have gone out. Um, and I'm excited to see, yeah, certainly based on the performances of Phillips and JB yesterday, excited to see what he does with it. Obviously, Sam, I'll come to you then for the final words. You, you got the first one, you can have the last one. Um, that's our, all of our summer loans recalled now or, or gone back to their parent clubs. Um, could it be, oh, well, I mean, Finn went back and got sold, but could it, could it be a bit of a blessing in disguise, the fact that Ian Foster now gets to stamp his um, his mark on this squad? I suppose, and another question, just riffing off the top of my head, um, is there, it, uh, have our, um, where am I going with this, have our uh, um, relationships with these clubs changed somewhat in terms of the fact that I can't see us dipping back in Aston Villa's pool anytime soon and, and Everton might, might not send talent to us as, as fast um two big ones there in, uh, well okay yeah sure in terms of whether it would be a blessing in disguise um in the case of Kessler Hayden maybe um I think he had some good moments for sure had some really good games for sure I think he's a player who's got a high talent caliber but he also made a lot of mistakes um he wasn't the best in the world out of possession so I think him with him maybe with Warrington, almost certainly, because if we say that JB has been the direct replacement for Warrington, if you like, because we're basically adding another CM into the fold, then yes, because he's trusted to play and isn't injured, which already makes him an upgrade on Warrington. So yes, I think in Warrington, yes, and we're already seeing that with JB. I don't think JB was great yesterday, but he had some good moments. Um, so in Warrington, yes. In Kesslade, possibly yet, yes. In Cundall, probably not. And in advance, well, most certainly not, because I don't think we're going to get players in who are better than those two, really. Cundall, we might. I think, you know, Cundall was good, but maybe we might just strike gold with our loans and get somebody exceptional. But I, I don't think so, to be honest. And advance, um, you know, if we get somebody better than advance, I'll, I'll eat my hat. Um, yeah, I think, I think in terms of the part two about a relationship with clubs, I would be cautious to read too much into that. I think... The only one where there might be a slight souring of relations is Wolves because they they sold him to to loan him out elsewhere to another club and a club who, shall we say, there's a little bit of residual tension with, to say the very least. Um, but even then, you know, if if if, if something comes up and it, you know it's good for all parties as a player who would improve us, and Wolves want him to get game time, I I, I don't think we would let that get in the way. Uh, in terms of Villa, no, absolutely not. They've made the decision that's best for them financially, which is to cash in on Finn's abs. Obviously, we're all heartbroken, but Villa don't, you know, it's not their job to look after the well-being of Argyle fans. They did the right thing for them and their club. With Kessler Hayden, again, I think they've probably also done the right thing for them and their club because um, they've recalled a player to help, you know, make up the numbers in their matchday squad. And I think it's also worth pointing out that maybe, you know, Kessler Hayden has... You know, and I think this is a fair thing to mention because he's mentioned it on his own social media, commented about uh, an illness of a close family member, and maybe in that scenario, wanting to be nearer to his loved ones is it's something that may come into the equation, um, even if it means not playing football, which I think is totally fair enough. So, so I don't think any relation to Sarah with Villa at all. I think there might be a few, you know, uh, bruised egos with regard to Wolves, but... Like I say, I'd, I'd hope that if there was a loan opening, we'd all be professional about it. Um, and with regard to Ever Everton, I I think, let's be honest, if you're an Everton loan manager or an Everton scout or whatever, watching Warrington's performances for us, I think you'll probably, uh, they will, they're not stupid, they'll understand why we didn't give him another chance. And realistically, he's been injured anyway. So, well, I no, I think Villa and Everton know. Because we didn't see them, so... 
Well, I, yeah, you know what I mean. I, I mean the ones who did play, like <laughs> Bristol City and like his, even his 10 minute cameo against Southampton when, when he came on at 1 1 was pretty poor as well. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think relations with Sound Villa or Everton at all, no. And then famously, we also have no other connections to Everton at all uh, in terms of the hierarchy of, of the club. So, yeah, I can't see us getting any players. Well, quite, yeah. <laughs> quite. Nice. Um, anything to add before we go? I think we call that a night. We're not doing a Cardiff preview this week because there's something new coming from Ben, James Stables, one team in Devon, um, Adam Price of this parish, and um, Alberto, uh, an Italian statistician who is a, an Argyle fan. Something new is coming. An Italian, an Italian one story, statistician. Yeah. Statistician, I think you mean, yeah. I don't know what a statistician is, but... <laughs> It's Italian, mate. I don't speak the lingo. Um, so <laughs> they're bringing something new sometime this week. So it's going to be basically uh, um, Ben's rant post it, which uh, all about stats went down really well. So we're doing a, a stats based pod. Um, and also it means that we get an extra half an hour off. So that's good. Um, anything to add? I, um, I, did, I did say to you yesterday, Aaron, for the interest of our listeners, I think you should just put the Cardiff preview from Boxing Day back into everyone's feed and see if anyone notices because almost nothing has happened since then. And and have uh, and just have a robot read in Ian Foster uh, every time that we mention Jude Um Why don't you do it? See if anyone notices. I might do that. They might notice now that you've mentioned it. Um, and I cannot be able to of it. Aaron, 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 no one is still listening. Um, but if you are still listening make sure you um, subscribe on whichever podcast platform you are listening to us on whether that be apple pods spotify or youtube and make sure you find us on twitter facebook instagram and tiktok which um yesterday's tiktok went down pretty well go find that some there's some um as i would say stats maybe i'm a statistician um on that one. Cheers, guys. Oh, thank you very Aaron. much. Aaron, I've got one more. Go on. Jamie Mackey against Barnsley yes. in 2008. Good shout. Wait, how did we forget Mackey? Yeah, great shout. Two goals on debut. Can't get much better than that, apart from a hat trick on debut, which, uh, let's be honest, we've had about six or seven hat tricks since I've been a fan, so none of them are on debut. I was, gonna, I was very surprised. Although, that although was Carapaz was in wasn't his second game. Pericards was in the second game. Um, Ross it's Jenkins, um, no, because his first game was also at home. Um, no, it might have been his third game because it was a midweek at Stoke. Ne- never mind. Forget forget that. Cut. Um, oh, anyway, uh, Ross, Ross, Ross Jenkins, um, I wasn't at that Walken game, um, to be honest, but he scored and we won 3-2. So, yeah, know. great. Do you ever go to games? Just yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you watched it on my follow or you didn't go. I'm a, I'm a massive pop up, Aaron. You know me. No, um, the 2011 to 2014 era, I was at university. So my that was by far my sparsest era of attending games. So I missed when we were rubbish, which was great. I just, you know, I, I left the League One and I came back to us being a playoff chasing side. It was all right, really. I missed the bottom of League Two days. I'd say I still went to some games, obviously, but not, not nearly as many. And you can hear more about of, uh, Sam's <laughs> uh, My Argo Life uh, next week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if, if people want more sound down content we can do a sound down my Argo life in which he interviews himself uh, that sounds very good right cheers guys cheers, all. cheers mate thanks Aaron